that formula is somewhere in this book that I can point you to, if you will. Well, I may have spoken too early. They don't know this is basic. I stand correct. This is a basic book. So that formula is not in this book because this is basic. Let me give you the formula again. You want to write it? I'm sorry. I thought it was in the book. And so once you get that number, then how does that help me to determine the efficiency of my pop? Because based on that and the, what size and color, changing the impeller changes the gallons per minute. Once you change any one thing, gallons per minute, the head, uh, the revolution, that change all the factors. It goes back to the affinity laws. It changes all your factors. Factors. So simply going from, let's say, a seven and a half impeller to an eight inch, that little small change will make a drastic difference. I need something that's blank. This is not blank. But something like that, where you pump more gas per minute, would it draw more energy? Will it cause use? more energy? In some cases, yes, depending on, again, we're looking at the efficiency. And so we look at pump curves for that also to give us some indication. So what we're looking at is motor horsepower. And this is my big chart here. I'm sorry to apologize. Uh, we have gallons per minute times feet of head. And I'm just going to put head because of my limited space. But that's head and feet. So if you have PSI, how do I convert that to feet? What? Give me some depth. 2.34. <laughs> Utilize that. Divided by, there is a constant 3960, 3960, times pump efficiency, and it will be in percent, change it to a decimal, times motor efficiency. So, gallons per minute divided by feet? No, times uh, feet of okay. air divided by. 3,960 times PE times ME, which is pump efficiency, motor efficiency. Now, where do you get that? Oh, that's on that plate, I think, on your motor. Well, on it motor. is initially, but what happens to efficiency? As you increase the gallons per minute or something, it affects the efficiency of the pump. As your head increase, it affects the efficiency or the output of your pump. And increase what happens to the output. It's going to decrease. So it can change on. But and I mean, how do you get that? How do work? I mean, the motor's just sitting there. How, where do you get the PE and the Where do you know? If I have all of this, I can figure that out. Because there can, there can be one thing else. So it just depends on what I have available. Uh, there. This is not a problem, not a problem. Those are constant. Those are constant. So once I have that number there, I'm going to multiply those results, which would be MHP, times 0.746. That is that conversion to kilowatts. Once I've converted it to kilowatts, how many hours in a day? 24. And that will give me kilowatt hours. So this converts horsepower to kilowatt, 24 hours, kilowatt hours. And I can compute and, and actually do an analysis of my pump, you know, how much is it going to cost for a year, for a month, for operations, as long as it's within certain efficiency. Depends on the area you're in, too, because Cunningham you know, is on Jackson Purchase. Basically, yeah. I did it for the Sedalia. The electric bills had to tell you what it is at Sedalia pretty much. For within 10,000 gallons of the same amount of water pump, had. Had. And it goes back to again how efficient. How long has that pump been in operation? Well, actually. And how efficient is it? What's the size? I'm sorry, I'm no, I'm just damage. talking about the electrical rates from one system. Oh, the one rate. Right so right. Okay, the rate. Power rate. Oh, well, yeah. and I can't do anything about the no, power no. rates for you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, in your uh, well construction information for as the well all, keep in mind we have a baseline of everything, 
after that well has been put into service or after it's been developed uh, prior to putting in service, uh, remember we're collecting that team's chemical analysis. Um, we're doing a 36 hour pump test. We have an electric log material setting, the well size and depth. All of that, you should have that. Um, the checklist, the deed or ownership, uh, construction data, all of that should be something readily where you can put your hand on it. If someone were to ask you to go get the information. Okay. Because there is a stipulation on retention of records. No, you didn't lose it. No, I said I have most of those. Oh, you have all of those. Is this in the book? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, as far as this. Uh, you can find, again, the 36-hour, the chemical analysis and that tea so in portions. If you go to the basic water chapter in the book, also you'll find some of this because that's part of the, the basic. Okay, performance monitoring, static pumping, and the drawdown, again, specific capacity, gallons per minute per feet of drawdown, all of that you want to maintain. Physical characteristics of the water, the flow, the color, the odor, all this is baseline. And if you go back to the basic water chapter, um, characteristics, it's going to reiterate some of the same things as what's needed for information gathering. Um, sand production at the start, again, this is something else that you can do as an operator as, as part of your process control, you can use an Imhoff cone. Are you all familiar with Imhoff cones? Okay, that's this, uh, it's a cone that's set up to show efficiency and how much sand, usually it's an efficiency test uh, that's done. And at the bottom it is uh, graduated in milliliters per liter. Uh, and so what you do, well, make a sample, pour it in there and allow it to settle. Usually you're looking at selling for about an hour, but about 45 minutes you want to kind of give it a shake uh, and then let it continue to settle for the final, not a vigorous shake, 15 minutes or so to see how much sand is actually being produced from that well. So Imhoff cones can be used in order to show this. About how much uh, sample do you have to take out of your well to get About that? a thousand meals okay. is what the average cone, the size of the cone. Thousand millimeters. A thousand. Okay. All right. So trouble <laughs> symptoms, things that you should be concerned about when you start seeing this. If there is a drop in pump performance, again, that is indicated by a reduction in the gallons per minute. That's a warning sign. Changes in your static and pumping level. If something is going on. You need to do additional investigation. Or if you have increased sand production or water turbidity, because we've already said groundwater should be fairly clear because of, again, the percolation process through the various layers. Uh, if there is a taste or odor problem, such as gases, hydrogen sulfide, some people will from time to time call in, my water smells like sulfur. Again, that's that rotten egg smell. Uh, if you have slugs of brown or black or red water, it indicates different things, so you need to know what does it mean. Red water could be an indication of iron, 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 iron bacteria, or iron. Black water. Okay, manganese. And brown water? Yeah, but back to, again, corrosion. Okay. Um, if there's an increase in your chlorine demand, how do we determine that? We inject chlorine at the site. If the farthest reach of our system, there's none there. When there's usually at least a point two, because EPA says that's the minimum that you should have. But all of a sudden there's none. Well, there's a demand. Where is that demand coming from? All right, so those are the problem areas, trouble symptoms, when you know you need to start something. Uh, when to rehabilitate a well, again, 
you're looking at that specific capacity where again that was gallons per minute per foot of draw day. Um, and you're going to, you should have where you're plotting this over time so you can see where there is a dramatic de decrease. But if you don't have that visual thing that's being plotted from time to time, look at your production rate. Uh, look for the percentage of change. Okay, full recovery greater than 85 percent. Extensive work if it's less than 85, but greater than 60. Um, not likely less than 60, but greater than 40. It's bad if it's under 40 percent. So you want to make sure that put up put up your graph. Do that as an operator and keep up with that type of information. Um, what I have for designer construction, again, it could be based on overpumping. Do I have too many wells that were in a circle of influence or radius of influence overlap? Because all of that can also create the issues that we were just talking about. Um, what about with the well development? Did we remove the drilling bugs? If not, that could be an issue. Uh, Cakes and fine sands, or again, um, if I have low production, do I have encrustation of my screens or what have you? Was there faulty construction or connections not properly uh, made? Poorly close bottom. Is there a high velocity? water through the well screens because if that water comes in so fast the encrustation will happen a lot faster that's one of the reasons why the gravel pad that minimizes the pumping of sand also protects the well screen and allows us to have those larger screens did we just start with poor materials to begin with or is there an issue with my gravel pad wrong pumping motor specification that's the reason we rely on, again, all those things for determining what's the best pump for my application, and hopefully the engineer gets it right for us. But if you're an operator, you should have some type of input as in to determine what's right, what size for what I'm doing. All right, we talked about sand pumping. How much sand is too much? Um, we're looking at less than three milligrams per liter by weight. 25 pounds um, per million gallon. That's where we want to be under that. We looked at the causes of sand pumpings. Could be faulty construction, loss of gravel pack. Remember, you're going to rectify that by correcting it. Uh, how did we minimize the pumping rates or minimize the sand pumping? Yeah, correct the gravel pack. I kind of gave there that away. Yeah, I had a time. So what were some of the others? Okay, good. Repair the screen. What else? Cycle. Wasn't that what you told me? Cycle last. Lower the gallons per minute. Um, EPA recommends less than five milligrams per liter. Um, by weight, if you want to know where they stood on the sand pumping. And again, you can measure it with the M-Hall cone and calculate the milligrams per liter. With that M-Hall cone, it's going to give you no liters per liter. All right, those are causes of uh, sand issues, which we've gone through, and, and ways you can minimize. Uh, use your valves to throttle to reduce the uh, gallons per minute and cycle less and maintain the gravel pad. You can also put in sand uh, separators. That also helps. Okay. And then some people uh, allow their ground storage tank to sort of act like their catch basin for sand. So that means because already with the ground storage tank, you're doing the annual inspection. So that means you're just clearing that foot or so out every year. I say foot or so. Have any of you all ever had more than that? Or do you have ground storage tanks? Or well, lights? elevated storage. Elevated. But, uh, elevated. Like, I know when we had our tank completely redone, it's going on six years ago now. And the time before that had been probably 15 years, and there was like 
Not that much. Thanks for not wishing. Super. Corrosion. Oh, that nasty, nasty word. Corrosion is simply uh, the process, the natural return of a metal to its original state. That's all that's happening with corrosion. Uh, it can be caused by the action of the water. Remember, high velocity of the water increases corrosion. It can also be the oxygen, high oxygen levels that are present. Carbon dioxide. All of those help that metal go back or return to its natu natural state. Um, corrosion can be caused by screen slot enlargement or plugging, casing corrosion, screen and casing failure. Okay, so we have three types of corrosion, hydraulic chemical and electrochemical. And I think earlier we talked about the chemical and the electrochemical. Now with the hydraulic corrosion that we see, caused by excessive pumping rates, and again, it goes back to throttling down to reduce the amount of gallons that we're pumping, or it could be caused by excessive velocity, uh, wear away the screen material, and uh, again, we implement those devices in place to reduce that. So this would be sort of like the hydraulic causes. much corrosion and stuff around that screen. That's why it's very important to make sure that you have the proper screens that are corrosion resistant and you can work with the infestation and I'll show you how. Um, stability indicators that you should be utilizing and again as operators you may not use all three and we'll show you the Bayless curve B-A-Y-L I-S Yes, that's the quick spell. Um, the Langler saturation index can be utilized. Uh, you would probably need a laboratory in order to run some of these analysis. pH, water temperature, we can handle without a problem in the field. But total dissolved solids, now I need what? need some type of heating instrumentation, which would be a drying oven at least 180 degrees or 103 degrees, depending on exactly which analysis or method that I'm utilizing in order to evaporate all the water uh, away. So that may be a little more difficult as a field method. Um, so total dissolve, and the other part of that total dissolve solids, you have to have filtration device because how we figure the total dissolved solids is you figure, you filter amounts, what's dissolved will go through the filter, you then take that filtrate and put it in the oven to let the water evaporate off, and then you're going to weigh it. And that's how you determine the total dissolved. Calcium and alkalinity concentration. Alkalinity may be a titration that can be performed in the field with the right chemical. Um, calcium uh, gravimetric method, and again, you may need the laboratory for that. We can also utilize the calcium carbonate precipitate potential, which again looks at a um, sample that is spiked more or less and one that is not. Again, that's a lab measurement, but the one that I like best is the Bayless curve, put 20 S on there, because uh, an operator can do that and much of it can be done in the, the field. We use the, al the uh, pH and the alkalinity, and we plot it on this scale. So this is the Bayless curve here. Um, and the way it reads, the green, of course, is your stable line. So we want to make sure that at all times, we're between, between this red and yellow line here. Uh, anything below the red line is corrosive. Anything above the yellow line is scale forming. Okay? And neither is good for our operation. So we want to be between the lines. So the reason I was asking you about alkalinity earlier, because you mentioned about the pH being way up here, adding chemicals, uh, which tells me that your natural alkalinity is very, 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 very good. <coughs> 
So based on that we plot, let's say if my pH is seven, which that's where we want it to be, and my alkalinity is about 200, then that's, that's about where I want to be. I want to be in that area there. So 200 and better alkalinity about seven. And you're, you're talking like that without adding any chemicals? Yeah, this is just without adding chemicals. Of course, as you add lime or soda ash or what have you to increase that pH, again, it will affect where you fall. So you can manipulate to be in the right area by the addition of chemicals. So, so does this curve continue on? Because, I mean, a lot of the raw water here is I go 5.5. He's going to have to drop a lot of that. Yeah, really? yeah we're 5.5 to 6.5. So if you're so well starting up, then answer me this. Your polyphosphates are toward the end. Why not do something initially after that well? Do you add any type of caustic soda, soda, ash, mm -hmm. grapes? Oh, you do do that too. That's what I'm saying. That I would have to add so much caustic to get the yeah. pH up to where I need it for the water to be stable. And that's based on. I mean, I, I, you know, I hate. Well, I hate adding any, but yeah. I really hate adding as much as it takes to get that pH way up really? there like that. So, you know, it's so. Would I be better off like trying to run a seven? or trying to be at an 11 where the water stabilizes. And it goes back to the alkalinity you know. characteristics of the water. Does the scale go on and on with you? Yes, it does drop below that. I've seen some that do uh, go be below that, okay? So, so would the Langlier be more applicable? If for, now both of those are more water? accurate, this gives me an indication. So again, I introduced this as an operator's tool. Right, but if their if their raw water is below six to begin yeah. with, this that doesn't even work. It, there's yeah. no, it's automatically going to be corrosive. Yeah, you're right. But when I do the Langlers, it's going to tell me the same thing too. Yeah. But it's a more accurate text. You're absolutely right on that. But this is just a tool that operators can use. All right, so. We have the hydraulic corrosion, chemical corrosion, um, when you have large amounts of gases, carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen, hydrogen sulfide, which again, not only do I have corrosion, but now I have a odor, possible taste problem also. Um, it makes the water corrosive, uh, degrades the metal surface when it comes in contact with these gases also cause the pitting of the metal, which now we have little areas where we're out there repairing. Because once my pipe is corroded, my pressure goes down, what do I need to do now? It dropped below 20 PSI. Well, that's probably easy, probably easy. Yeah, I need to report it. <laughs> I gotta report it. Not only do I report it to the state, that's when I have to tell my consumers that they need to do something else to their water before using it for drinking or for cooking. What is the minimum normal PX line that you all have? The minimum normal. Depends on which plant, but like. No, it doesn't. Depends on which plant. It what does, is the state? <laughs> what's the state say? The, the normal. Oh, what is, I thought you meant how they run. I mean, I yeah. would use a pressure reporter on all of them to keep up with, but like one of them, the lowest it gets is like thirty-five. Okay. Do you ever drop below thirty-five? Well, like on a main break or something. Yeah, you know, and it drops how low? Well, it depends on where the break is and how quick I get to it. Zero sometimes. <laughs> a lot of times. <laughs> so definitely that would be the case where know. again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and it happens everywhere, uh, especially when you have oh, all those main breaks. Well, that's why a lot of times, like our main breaks, the bowl of water advisor will be system wide because the system is so small yeah. that the water pressure, if it drops here, it's dropped here. It's not like in zones. I mean, you know, like Sedalia, we have four 
total miles of transmission mm -hmm. lines. So yeah. 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 All right, and then we talked about the electrochemical again, where we have difference in the electrical uh, potential. Remember, you had all four possibilities. You had no cathode. Um, the, um, the electrolyte, which again can be the water with the dissolved solids, as well as a different metal coming into all into contact with each other. Uh, welded joints could be an example of where that could occur. You know, two different metals. Your torch cut to expose the threads or cracks in your paint coatings, uh, which should not contain any lead in it whatsoever, but you may have various other metals present there that can create that scenario. Another type of uh, corrosion was a galvanic corrosion, where those two different metals come in contact, submerged in the electrolyte, which happens to be the water. Um, and then because they're in contact, you're going to get the corrosion. Well screens may be made of two different metals, your steel shaft, bronze bearing. That's why it's so critical when you're putting all these components together for your well, you want to make sure the material, they're compatible. They're compatible. That you're following whatever the manufacturer's recommendation because hopefully they're the expert on your bearings, what type of bearings, and that you're using the correct bearings based on the pump, the shaft that's in play. Because you know, if you're like my dad, it was like, okay, anything that fit that he had around, he was a mechanic. That foot the bill. We can't do that. We gotta make sure that we're not creating issues ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> and some, you know, a lot of times it's homeowners too, you know, they'll, they play, they hook their ground line to their water. Oh, mm -hmm. no, no. It's like, no, the Well, a lot of them, like the older houses, the electrician would ground, or like the phone lines, you know, yeah. the, the ground line would be grounded to the metal plumbing. Yeah. But uh, again, inspectors should be in place. But you said it was the older home, so yeah, I, can't, I can't say anything to that. All right, cathodic protection would be one way of rectifying corrosion. Um, remember, with that, you're going to use a sacrificial anode that will over time corrode. Um, the electron flows from the anode to the cathode. It degrades the sacrificial anode, plating the cathode. So your level, wherever the water is, uh, the level of the tank below the water level is protected. But above the water level, it's not protected. All right, how do we handle well corrosion? Um, we have chemical incrustation. Again, we talked about the sand pumping. It's not just about sand, but it's about all those other materials that may adhere to that screen also. Builds up the minerals on the well screen caused by calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, silver clay, or biological slime and tubercles um, can grow that screen. How do we reduce the encrustation? And I think Charles pointed this out earlier, is that you can acidize your screen, hydrochloric acid, sulfanic acid, hydrosilic, so acetate acid can be used. Um, you want to make sure whatever acids you're using, and SF approved, because again, it's coming in contact with our drinking water source. And something like that too, we would also need to approve. Okay. Even if it is NSF approved, we still mm -hmm. want a request on it. Okay. And the um, rule of thumb there, any change or anything you're about to do or think that you want to do, pick up the phone, let them know. It's better to let them know ahead of time than after the fact. Because <laughs> after the fact, they're only going to see our backside because we're trying to run away. But we want to Hey, alert them to the fact, make them our partner in the corrective action. 
as opposed to our enemy. We always want them on our side. Believe you me, it cuts down a lot of headaches for everybody in the long run. Because I have been on both sides of the entity where I did not want to see them coming because I failed to do what they asked me to do, and which led to enforcement, but squarely on my shoulder because I failed to follow through. So get them on their side. Um, make sure that if you're going to utilize the acid treatment as your means of correction or compliance, um, that you have a way to properly dispose of what you're utilizing, okay? And we're still pulling back tea samples. Anytime you do anything to that well, after it's done, disinfect, pull the back tea samples to ensure the quality of the water. So that's a plug swing there. Do we have to do that four times? Of course, it's not about the past. Okay, here's some others that are somewhat plug, still play plugging. Other treatment, water brushing, blasting or shooting it, um, using uh, various chemicals that must be on a food list to be used, uh, carbon dioxide or high pressure gas, that nation jetting can also be used. Um, it's going to help with the biological fouling, reducing the sulfur bacteria, iron bacteria, and also um, other things that may be occurring. And at the end, again, you want to make sure that if you're using, dose it with uh, chlorine, residual tin, and make sure you're disinfecting any other type of equipment that you may be utilizing. I think okay, this something is, helps. Huh? You know, this fellow that does my well once a year, he's got a TV camera. Mm. He goes down before Super. and after. Super. So you're not getting gypped, you know. Yeah, excellent. These people used to run around and paint your tire, you know, they had a bucket of paint and paint brush and a guitar and Go they tell you they went in there and saw so many pits they could well for you and all this. That don't work anymore. Absolutely. Inspector, he goes in there and makes pictures, fixes you a book when he gets done, and then when he gets through painting and cleaning, he gives you another book. Excellent. So Word of mouth is an excellent advertising too. And I know they didn't pay you anything, but you appreciate the fact that they're showing you that they did what they said they were going to do. I went through that too many years yeah. with gypsies running around with paint. Yeah. Everybody does so, it because that's all there was out there. That's <laughs> like the mechanic. They'd see a town with a tire and they'd stop in. <laughs> Nobody wants to go find a water tire and inspect their work. So yeah. we're at their mercy. <laughs> well, nowadays you better be looking at what they're doing and you know, putting some inspector on that job to make sure it's done. I don't know how many lines you all lay here or repair on the wastewater side. But we have the issue where a lot of times <coughs> we would hire a contractor to come in and slip line and hopefully, you know, cut the tax back in. None of that was done. There was just enough space for it to continue to work till after the warranty. Now, all of a sudden, <laughs> It's like People that. Yeah, then it became a major problem. Why? So you, you almost need someone to go back and inspect behind the people that you're hiring to come in and do these jobs. We had some of that slip line, did it? Yeah. And the guy, he had a TV camera, went in right behind his little robot that cut the holes. Uh -huh. When he left, he, he gave me a complete set of videos. Excellent. So, That's excellent service. So this is what it looks like prior to a carbon dioxide treatment. Do you see the difference? The mm -hmm. clogging here. Look at this. It's pretty doggone oh. good. Mm -hmm. um, for biological fouling, iron bacteria, pumping and circulates the uh, atmospheric air down the hole, dissolving the oxygen in the well water. Um, the sulfur bacteria, sulfur is oxidizers used, sulfur reducing, and also it helps with hydrogen sulfide in slime. The iron bacteria oxidizes iron for energy. 
So from 0.5 to 4 milligrams per liter, um, DO uh, <coughs> to 0.1 milligrams per liter to iron. So it can be effective. Then when it's not removed, that's what we can be sending our consumers. You drink that? Sure. Oh, I want my water to look just a little cleaner. All right, chemical uh, treatment of the bacteria, aeration, jetting, and surging. And again, chlorine, but realize what those dosages are. That's pretty strong stuff. That's super, 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 super coordinated. If I'm putting 100 milligrams per liter, I mean 100, that's 1,000. 2,000 milligrams per liter, you better find a way of uh, be coordinating that fire. So we have chlorinated water forced through the well screens. Potassium permanganate can also be used, which is another very strong oxidizer. Using potassium permanganate in this range here, I don't know how you feel about the color, but um, you can mess up quite a few pictures and things like that. Oh, let me tell you, it's a creative you should have. Yeah. I know this one town that absolutely banned it <laughs> from their um, green sand filters. They were using it at one time in conjunction with the uh, potassium permanganate. Uh, one of the operators kind of got carried away and sent pink water all through the system. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not a good thing. Not a good thing whatsoever. So the mayor put the axe on that after that. Mm -hmm. no. um, acids are used again with bacteriocides more than the pH less than two. And so because of that, because we're trying to get rid of biological growth, and you have to make sure that you are not getting rid of that after the end of it. All right, and again, you gotta have some way of going in and testing, maintaining, preventative maintenance. How do you know if there's no weed growth? The truth of the matter is, whatever's in that well, if it's built up at one time, there's always a possibility of it's returning. So that's just common. If I have this iron bacteria that's naturally occurring, then I know that this is something I need to put on my preventative maintenance program. And, and please don't think because you're doing monthly back teas that you're gonna catch all this. I mean, because um, most of that stuff is not total call forms, so mm -hmm. it's not going to show up in your monthly back teas. So. That's a true statement. That's a true statement. So it goes back to, again, looking at all the mechanics and your data <coughs> and what's going on at that well site. Camera survey just reiterates what Charles uh, pointed out to know that we at least cleaned it up at the time that it was rehabbed. Make sure you have food there. All right. So um, these come into handy after the well com is completed. Prior to permanent pump installation, doing regular pump inspection and operation. After you've gone through the process of doing all the biological treatments and identifying screen casing problems, excellent tool to utilize. All right, they reiterate about the various pumps that we talked about earlier. We have various types of centrifugal pumps, left line shaft turbine pumps, uh, water lubricated, cooled by the water. Some may be oil lubricated, if they're oil lubricated, make sure it is a food grade lubricant. Shaft is enclosed in the oil tube, so this is just reiterating, going a little more in detail as to what we have mentioned earlier. Okay. We have the submersible turbine. Uh, again, they are cooled by water passing into the pond. Uh, very quiet in operation, reliable. A quality wiring, check your voltage and amperage from time to time. Okay. And they're set up in series. Now, how do I know I have pump troubles? Again, I'm going to use my eyes, my sight, my nose. 
If for whatever reason cavitation starts to occur, broken suction, sucking in air, jerky, bubbly delivery of the water, a reduction of gallon, all of these are indication that, hey, something is happening with my pump. I need maintenance, the fog screen. If my pump does not start, it's a problem. If it doesn't start, it's not gonna pump the water. If it goes up every five minutes, I was on an inspection, and, and I wasn't there to inspect, I was just there to observe. But it, it never fails. Whenever an inspection is set up, if anything goes wrong, everything goes wrong. And on that particular day, it was a chemical pump. It will pump about two minutes, did nothing. And so he's like, this is not what happens every day. And I know it wasn't the case, but again, you want to look at things like that and make sure that you have an operator around where they can pick up on those maintenance things. Doesn't deliver water, uses too much power. And again, how do I know that? Well, one way is when you get that bill for it, but now you know how to calculate it too, if it is using too much power. Or if the capacity is low or vibrates excessively, especially if it's out of alignment uh, with your motor. Again, it's going to decrease efficiency. I need to make sure that I'm investigating and correcting those issues. So on a daily basis, check for your motor heating. That's where, again, those smells come into place, the feel, uh, unusual bearing noise. If I'm hearing squealing, have I gone too long with changing that bearing out? Yeah. Or whining? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I want to make sure proper maintenance and that I'm just changing my bearings out every time I break that down. The, now the usual life of a bearing is about how many months? And I did say months because I know some guys say, oh, I haven't changed mine out in five years or so. And in some cases it may work. But the usual life, you're looking at 18 to 24 months of a bearing. It's made to fail. It's made to aid and protect that very high dollar shaft that's in place. So know that and that they need to be replaced from time to time. Um, shaft indication, uh, reservoir, uh, the drops per minute or excessive vibration. So look for all of that on a monthly basis. We're going to look at the static pumping drawdown level, and again, use that hydrograph to plot it. Physical characteristics of the water. Groundwater, how often are we testing for groundwater during the chemical contaminants? How often are we testing for groundwater on the chemical contaminants? I'm not sure what you're Three years. Doing. Every three years. Thank you! <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I'm still not sure yeah. what, what the question is. Well, because he's wanting that, you know, like your SOCs and your, right? The DOCs, DOCs and okay. your well, right, those and your, all of those. If you, know, you have no issues. detections. If right. you have no detections, that's right. Every three years, once every three years, those are the items that show up on that CCR on a yearly basis, right? Cool. So yeah, so you want to make sure you're doing the physical characteristics and you're keeping up with that also, gallons per minute and calculating the specific capacity. All right, we talked about uh, cavitation, the air pockets there. Um, effects of cavitation, excessive impeller damage and wear, which again reduces efficiency uh, there. You can see the pitting away and um, that's, that's pretty stressful there. So we're checking for all of that stuff there. That's just a different type of motor. Uh, just telling you again some of the things you want to make sure that you're checking for. So make sure that you have a preventative maintenance set up for your well, where you're doing the daily, the weekly, quarterly, some annually, annually checks of various components. Um, what else? With your motor, we didn't talk much about motors, but for the most part, small systems, 
What is the most common electrical motor that you utilize? Three phase or squirrel cage, because they're very rugged, works well. Make sure with your motor, keeping them clean, keeping them dry, and aligned and tight. The number one failure of electrical equipment is dirt. Okay. Make sure again it's properly lubricated. Now, too much grease is just as bad as too little. So follow the manufacturer's recommendation. Friction free, free of straight oil. And that's what we said too much, just as bad as not as all at all. Some of the things you want to do on a daily basis, uh, as far as pumping motors, inspect the oars daily, uh, especially changes in the weather, thrust bearing oil changes as required, uh, oil bearing grease. Now, some of these say oil and some say grease. Is there a difference in oil and grease? Is there a way that I can consolidate the amount of uh, various types of lubricants that I have? Yes, and I say utilize whatever major oil company you have. They'll come out, they'll do a survey of what you're using, what is required by your different instrumentation, because they have all kinds of different equipment, and they will set up a program to consolidate it. Why do they come out and do this? Because hopefully you're going to utilize their service. And I know that works in Texas, I'm not sure how Kentucky works, but call them up and see if they will, they have to consolidate. The main thing, because it's water, all of our oils, as well as greases, must be what? Food. Food grade, absolutely. All right, some don'ts. Don't close um, discharge valve. Why do you think they say that? We have uh, discharge valves. If we have a, and it goes mainly with positive displacement pumps, but a centrifugal pump, it does not matter if you start it up um, against the closed valve, but if you have a positive displacement pump that you <coughs> try to operate with that valve closed when it should be open, you're going to end up damaging your pumps there. Okay, no oil dripping on the pump shaft. Um, you want to make sure that you're listening for excessive vibration and noise, erratic flow, look for that and make sure you don't operate long with that flow meter being out. All right, surface casing failure can be an issue. So make sure that you stay abreast of that. All right, that concludes the groundwater production as well as the so can I add one thing to that? You can add more than one thing. Go right ahead. You know, she, she talks about doing all this daily and monthly and quarterly and semi-annual and, and annual stuff that you need to look at. Document, document, document. Not only is it good for your records so that you'll know and be able to go back and look and say, oh, well, yeah, it's been five years since I've changed those bearings or whatever. But it also is a CYA thing, because if something does happen, you better believe somebody's going to be asking you all those questions. And, you know, then you can pull out your little book, your little log book, and say, oh, yeah, look, I did this and this and this and this and this. Mm -hmm. So back up. So they know that you're trying and that you want to provide a product <coughs> that is aesthetically pleasing, not only aesthetically pleasing, but is, that is also bored of all of those pathogenic organisms. And then they know that you're acting like the champions of the environment now on your side. And, it, and it's not really us, it's the lawyers that, <laughs> you know. You're just the overseers, uh, more or less. And in that regard, that's a good thing because we're trying to do the best that we can do, but a lot of times it takes a second pair of eyes, someone who has not seen it, that can point things out that, hey, I overlooked. Didn't mean to, but I did. Oh, I dropped the ball there. So an extra set of eyes is always a good thing. That's the reason the federal government first checks and balances. Well, and plus, we see 
all different types of systems and scenarios and problems and issues and you know we might know what worked for one system and it might work for you might not but Excellent. when you're dealing with just your one specific system there's a lot of things that you might miss that we would have seen otherwise you know so and they can tell you a lot of times I call these guys all the time you know if one's not in I ask for the other so but uh, just like when they come for an inspection I know they're, it's not like I can't wait to find something wrong on this guy it's like you know we take care of this or this right. needs done so, you know. and that's good y'all are just back and forth huh mm -hmm. I see it. That's good. No, but that's a good working relationship, and that's what everybody would want to have with a regulatory agency. All right. We're about to go into disinfection. Um, there is a short film that we're going to see on chlorine safety initially, and then we'll go right into the disinfection chapter. Do we need a break before the film? Because I know we had lunch about an hour or so. Yes or no? Because if not, let's take a potty break. All right, we'll take that off of the Let's take five. 